Good evening, everybody. Good evening. I'd like to start by welcoming you all to this evening's presentation, Life and Death in Colorado, an American Doctor in Africa. I would also like to thank the Green Mountain Return Peace Corps Association, the Global Health Program at the UVM Warner College of Medicine and Western Connecticut Health Network, and Dare to Touch Attack for sponsoring this evening's presentation. And finally, my gratitude to you all, the audience, for your attendance here tonight to learn more about Dr. Armstrong's important work in international development and global health and for thinking beyond the borders of the Great Mountain State. In John F. Kennedy's inaugural address in 1961, he famously uttered these words that inspired a generation and beyond. He said, And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. My fellow citizens of the world, ask not what America will do for you, or what together we can do for the freedom of man. Finally, whether you are citizens of America or citizens of the world, ask of us the same high standards of strength and sacrifice which we ask of you. With a good conscience, our only sure reward, and history, the final judge of our deeds, let us go forth to lead the land we love. In this speech, President Kennedy asked Americans to engage, to be citizens of the world, to create impacts, to lead and to build bridges in America and beyond. This calling is still very timely today. Having grown up in a large religious family dedicated to being of service to others, Dr. Eichens heard this clarion call clearly. In 1974, she left for Niger to teach English as a Peace Corps volunteer. Her time as a volunteer was formative. Her firsthand experience with extreme poverty and the heartache of human suffering, particularly as evidenced through famine and drought in her village, led her to pursue her illustrious career in medicine. In 1982, she graduated from McGill University with her MD and CM, a Doctor of Medicine and Master of Surgery degrees. She later went on to procure her Master's in Public Health and Tropical Medicine from Tulane University. Her training and education prepared her for work for over 30 years in some of the most underserved communities in Africa. Her early work was in Naka, Nigeria, where she managed a 50-bed hospital and an orphanage. Most recently, she was the medical coordinator for the Ebola treatment team in Buchanan, Liberia, during the 2014 epidemic. And I see at least one of her colleagues sitting in the front row who works here at Egypt. Her most prolific work in global health and international development, however, came in Kulafai, Cameroon, where she served for 24 years as the district medical officer for 131,000 people on the Nigerian Cameroonian border. She remained here until insurgencies of Boko Haram did not allow her safe return to Kolapata. The criteria for her posting Kolapata was bookended by a real and unmet need for a doctor and a community that could provide housing. She soon discovered that Kolapata was a perfect match. She committed to an initial two-year assignment, and with a one-way ticket and a $250 a month stipend in hand, she set off for the Sahel, 3,000 kilometers and three days travel north from the capital city of Yaoundé to build a hospital. In 1990, when she arrived, she found a clinic that was corrupt, a biohazard, abusive, expensive, waste pit, and was providing medically unnecessary treatment. Those are my harsh words, not hers. More eloquently, she describes the 90s era Kolapata as a place where civil servants who had caused trouble elsewhere were posted to Kolapata as a punishment. Schools were generally scorned, languages were multiple, daytime temperatures during the three month hot season hovered around 115 degrees in the shade. Children were unvaccinated, tropical diseases, and the diseases of poverty were abundant. The district had not paved roads, no electricity, or running water no telephone or post office, no hospital, no doctor. She goes on to say in her book, in the namesake of this presentation, Life and Death of Father, an American doctor in Africa, near as I can tell, most people, particularly the children, live in a state of almost continual ill health, which is more or less accepted as normal. The need for medicines 
and understanding among the health professionals of how to use them is a key. The government hospitals cannot serve the poor as they are now set up and the poverty is wretched. People barely eke out a living from the dust. Whole villages are populated by emaciated children and adults. A patient may scrape together enough money for a day or two's worth of treatment, but not a whole week's worth, let alone more. Prescriptions for useless medicines are doled out, and the ignorant sick have no way of knowing which are truly needed for cure and which are for flesh. From that dubious starting point, she built a sustainable and economically solvent hospital that has remained operational even today in the face of bombardments and attacks from North Carolina since 2013. Her vision to create a primary health care center where all aspects of the World Health Organization gospel of primary care that could be applied in both preventative and curative cases was resoundingly successful. She ended up creating a 10 hectare, 13 pavilion hospital with 120 beds, where approximately 150 patient, patients were treated daily, 30 of whom had their cataracts surgically removed every day. The hospital now includes a children's ward, an x ray machine, an ultrasound, ophthalmologist without borders, a surgical unit, a maternity and female medical ward, an isolation ward, and there's also a robust vaccination and push campaign that the hospital runs. She supervised and trained 120 medical, paramedical, and support staff in six peripheral hospitals and one district hospital. She also conducted six trainings a year for medical personnel, all the while doing that very small task. She also continued to publish over 50 scientific journal articles in The Lancet and others. Because of her efforts, she was decorated twice by the government of Cameroon, first as officer of the Cameroonian Order of Merit, and subsequently as Knight of the National Order of Valor. And this year, she received the Esther Cole Lovejoy Award from the American Medical, Medical Women's Association for her work in international health. After 24 years of leading global healthcare initiatives and community development projects, Cole Afada was transformed. Medically, measles, polio, meningococcal meningitis, neonatal tetanus, leprosy, guinea worm, and trachoma disappeared from the district. Girls grossly increased their enrollment in school, and 51 primary schools were built in the area. The Center for Rural Women's Development hosted daily classes and had a chicken husbandry program. Several secondary schools, including one for technical training, were built, and infrastructure improvements occurred throughout the town, including the installation of cell phone towers, bridges, and boreholes for water. On top of all of her responsibilities, she also guided countless medical residents and interns in their rotations in tropical medicine over the years. She mentored eight Peace Corps volunteers in their rural development work in health and sustainable agriculture. When I arrived as the first Peace Corps volunteer ever in Colofana, I didn't yet understand the cultural landscape or the actual task of doing my job in the village. In response, Dr. Ellen definitely steered me towards the hospital polio vaccination campaign where I was privileged to vaccinate a thousand local children. She encouraged me to instruct elementary age girls who didn't have the opportunity to go to school at the Women's Economic Development Center. She opened up the hospital grounds to me to conduct trainings and seminars with waiting patients. And when I too invariably succumbed to malaria and anemic dysentery, she kept me healthy and productive. As a Peace Corps volunteer who served with Dr. Eichmann and Colafada, I am astounded and inspired by the extraordinary impact she has had and continues to have in this small African community. Her passion and her belief in serving other sentient beings and improving their health and well-being is unparalleled. And for that, it is my great honor and privilege to present Dr. Ella Meinschwitz today to speak to your honor, to speak to you of her experiences living and working in Africa. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Good evening. And thank you very much, Wendy, for that uh, lovely long introduction. Um, all tallied, I lived for 33 years in West and Central Africa, most of that in the Sahel, that band of land right under the Sahara Desert. <clears throat> most of the countries in the Sahel are very hot. And my body got so used to that heat that even now, three years later, I 
cringe when the temperature drops under 90. When it gets under 80, I reach for my scarf and gloves. I kid you not. <laughs> so you can imagine my concern when Wendy asked me to come. And I read that Vermont is the seventh coldest state in the Union. I looked it up. It turns out that people love to talk about your seasons. Yeah, four of them, right? Almost winter, winter, still winter, road construction. <laughs> and, or two, two, two of them, winter and the 4th of July. Nine months winter, three months not very good sledding. And on and on. Um, I'm happy to say that I found it not quite that bad. I studied um, at McGill University in Montreal, all of it undergraduate medical school, uh, postgraduate training. So you would think that I'd be used to the cold, and I, I guess at some point I was. For students at, at McGill, um, Vermont was Mecca. There's a favorable exchange rate back then, no tariffs back then. So cheap goods, um, passportless travel back then, American TV, um, midterm breaks and long weekends always saw a mass exodus of students from the dorms on University Street down to the marvelous, magical Burlington. Overly bookish, generally broke. I never made it to Vermont during my many years in Montreal, so this is a treat. And I'm grateful to uh, Wendy Rice, to the University of Vermont Medical Center, to Tetra Tech, to the Return Peace Corps volunteers, and to all of you for this chance to be with you tonight, um, to talk with you about refugees and global health, and to share with you some of my experiences in, um, as a frontline doctor in Africa. Since leaving, I work a lot with refugees now, so that's why I'm going to talk to you about refugees um, as well. But before I do, just a nod to Son Excellence, Her Excellency, Wendy Rice. I hope I'm not embarrassing her too much here when I tell you that for one shining moment, Wendy was the U.S. Ambassador to Cameroon. We had just built our women's education center, a sort of school for girls and women who had not had the chance to go to school. And um, for its inauguration, our local town authorities had planned a pomp-filled uh, ceremony. The American ambassador and the Canadian high commissioner promising to be among the invited guests and participants. The problem was that this was October 2001. And you all know what happened in September of that year. Because of 9-11 and our subsequent invasion of Afghanistan in the days preceding our planned inauguration, um, American ambassadors in many places that October were more or less confined to their embassies. And certainly, if it could be avoided, they were not venturing into the more Muslim parts of their countries as ours was. So at the last minute, the American ambassador sent her regrets, uh, asked PCV Wendy Rice as the most senior employee of the United States government for miles around to step up and fill in. And she did. She delivered a spot on ambassadorial address, had a beautiful blue outfit. I remember it to this day. Um, played her part with perfect panache and made us all proud. <coughs> Your fellow New Englander, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, was fond of the, the aphorism that a rising tide lifts all boats. Like many, he believed that when underlying conditions improve, then everyone is raised up. This is a goal of global health. And although we probably come at it from a variety of different angles, my guess is that most of us in this room today aspire to raise the tide with the aim of lifting all boats. 
Kennedy's critics were quick to point out that not everyone has a boat. And without a boat, in a rising tide, you drown. We're going to see more boats in a little while, so I ask you just to hold on to that thought for now, and we'll come back to it. I started working in Africa in 1974. That will seem like a long time ago to a few of you. But to me, it was yesterday. I remember well the heat that hit like a furnace blast when I stepped off that plane. The smells of uh, smoking wood and of onions frying in hot palm oil. I remember the sand everywhere and all along the roads at night in that capital city in which we landed, lines of little orange cooking fires set by the thousands of thin, hungry, homeless, internally displaced people, men, women, and children, who had migrated down from the Sahara to seek refuge from an historic, devastating famine. The term global health had not yet been invented when I started doing it, but it ended up occupying the better part of my life and bringing me to some of the most impoverished parts of Africa. Over these next few minutes, I will try to explain to you, in a way that I hope is not too roundabout, what led me and kept me there. In years of grave famine, grave drought leading to grave famine, in northern Cameroon, during the most difficult months after the millet has run out and before the okra is yet ripe, people resort to eating wild plants and insects, whatever can be forest, foraged. But during the hottest, driest season, when the ground is grassless dust and the more edible six-legged species are burrowed invisibly away, the hungry must find other sources of sustenance. One of these is cattle manure. At such times, people roam the countryside, collecting buckets full of dried dung. They pile the patties onto a fire, let it burn, and then uh, spoon the cinders into a clay pot whose bottom has been punched with holes. Boiling water is poured over the ash, and the bullion collected from the strained drips is mixed with dried leaves or petals. Ample seasoning and a slow simmer follow, and with that, a savory stew is set to serve for the evening meal. Although it might be quite delectable and not entirely devoid of nutritional value, I have never knowingly dined on dung. I hope I never do. But it is helpful for me to know that there are people who must. For ignorance, not knowing, not knowing about things like this is blinding and can lead us as individuals and as a country to make terrible decisions. I went to medical school yearning to become a doctor in some hard scrabble place like the one I had served as a Peace Corps teacher in rural Niger, some place where life was at its most elemental and fragile, and where a doctor could bring hope. Three insoluble problems, or conundrums, or mysteries, made this choice as clear to me as a mountain stream above the tree line. Some friends said to me, but we have our own poor on our own shores. Let's 
look after them and leave other people elsewhere to look after the rest. The children in distant lands dying of hunger, the parents fleeing persecution, the women trapped by oppression, the teenagers gobbled up by war. We owe them nothing. Let other people take care of them. My first problem, or conundrum, or mystery always, was that I could not ever figure out who these other people were who were supposed to be doing the caring, or what made me not one of them. On a hot, breezeless night, during my first months in Cameroon, before our hospital was yet up and running, I took a woman into my home. She was in her late 30s, maybe 40. Two days earlier, she had delivered her 18th and 19th children prematurely on the dirt floor of her thatch roof mud brick hut. Both babies had died. In fact, of her 19 children, only one, a nine-year-old boy, was still alive. The others had passed at different ages, a week, nine months, three years. The living boy had sickle cell anemia. And in rural Africa, nine is a ripe old age for a sickler. And already his eyes were yellow where they should have been white, and white where they should have been pink. The woman was tired, exhausted, spent, as if her whole life had flowed from her, all of it right down to these last two tiny premature drops. I think that if that woman were among us today, right here, where we could see her, her cheeks tear-stained, her hands calloused and cracked, her cloth faded to an indeterminate color, patched and torn. I think there's not a person in this room who would not offer her a word of encouragement, an outstretched hand, a piece of bread. We would not close our doors to her or deny her food, shelter, or medical help for her son. We would not turn away. We would not turn her away. If we saw her, we would not do any of these things. So my second problem always was realizing that it could not possibly make any difference whether that exhausted woman or any woman like her was here beside me or was across the room or across the street or across the ocean, she was. She was in desperate need of someone to offer help. And not only could I do that, but I could not not do that. Abba was a seven-year-old boy brought to our hospital one late November morning his body slung over the back of a donkey. A teenage boy walked on either side. I would learn that the three were brothers whose mother had died soon after uh, Abba was born. Their father died a few years after that, so they had been on their own for a while. I watched out my consulting room window as the older boys lifted Abba from the donkey, and I could tell already from the way the back of Abba's head nestled between his shoulder blades that the culprit was going to turn out to be meningitis. The brothers carried Abba into my room, set him on the, consult the examining table, and then stood erect and laconic at his side as I questioned them and examined their young sibling. The boy's skin was fiery hot, his breathing was rapid and labored. He was so thin, his skeleton could be traced, and raw sores had worn through 
at both hips. I wrote up orders and called health workers to convey Abba to the ward while the brothers went to the hospital pharmacy to collect medicines and materials needed uh, to start treatment. Once satisfied that everything was being done that could be done, I resumed seeing other patients. About half an hour later, I happened to look up out my window into the courtyard and I was stunned to see the older brother untying the donkey from its tether and leading it over to the door of the ward. The boy entered and seconds later he came out again bearing his ailing sibling in his arms. I jumped out of my chair, rushed outside to ask what was going on. We are going home, the older boy answered, eyes downcast. A quick inquiry revealed that the bill for Abba's treatment had come to the equivalent of nearly $12. And for this family, $12 to save the life of a seven-year-old was out of reach. The brothers explained that they would go to market on Saturday, three days away, sell their millet, and then they would come back. I tried to have them understand that without treatment, Abba would not make it to Saturday. Our hospital, which depended in part on patient fees to stay open, had a system for these kinds of cases. The system wreaked havoc for the person doing our accounts, but when patients or families were unable to make a payment up front, we let them leave something in hock, a string of beads, a piece of cloth, an old watch, and then redeem it however they could over time. I offered this option to the boys. The two older brothers withdrew to talk it over, and I, fearing we were going to end up with a pond donkey, started to calculate whether it would cost us more to feed the animal than it would cost to treat Abba's meningitis. Fortunately, I needn't have worried, for the middle brother disappeared and a few minutes later came lumbering back, trailing a seatless, rimless, brakeless bicycle that we took in hock instead. Abba was treated, recovered, and a week later was discharged well. In the scheme of things, his seven-year-old life had the value of a sack of grain. What kind of world, I asked myself, as I watched the threesome and their donkey dwindle down our hill, what kind of world do we live in? And how can we, the rich and powerful, accept a world where the life of a seven-year-old boy has the value of a sack of grain? And I wondered how I would feel if that boy were my cousin, or my brother, or my son. That was my third problem. And it kept me in Africa doing the work that I did for over three decades. I always considered myself the luckiest doctor on earth to have that privilege, which was for me a source a font of never-ending challenge, uh, enchantment, and joy. Back in the 70s, one of the tasks the Peace Corps asked us to undertake before we were shipped out was to read the book, The Ugly American. I don't know if volunteers still do that, but they should, and I did and the novel impressed me immensely. Published in 1958 and set in a fictionalized Southeast Asian country, the book was critical of America's typically brazen big project diplomacy and our typically brazen self-important di diplomats while being admiring of a down-to-earth unattractive, you might call him ugly, 
American, who was exceptional in that he had gone to the trouble of learning the local language and culture of the country in which he lived and worked. Senator John Kennedy was um, so moved by the book that he gave a copy of it to each of his Senate colleagues and then used it for inspiration when two months after his inauguration as president, he created the Peace Corps. By insisting that we get some grasp on the language and culture before stepping foot in our village, Peace Corps reinforced the notion that only by being immersed in a community could we hope to begin to understand it and to contribute meaningfully to it. Once in our village, then, we were respected all the more for that, however bumbling our efforts. And that dictum that learning a language was always a necessary first step stayed with me. And in later years, when I went to a new place, I would keep a small notebook in my pocket and pull it out as I walked around town. And men playing cards under trees and women pounding millet in courtyards knew that when the notebook came out, they would be asked to teach me some new word or phrase. This would cause them to laugh with splendid mirth that a skinny, bespectacled white woman from a faraway place and a doctor no less wanted to learn something from them. I work now on a team that provides new, newly arrived refugees from war-torn countries, their first encounter with American health care. Most of the people we serve have lived through horrendous tragedy. In Cameroon, after the arrival of Boko Haram, I saw the plight of refugees from the other end as we cared for victims of bombs and burned villages, for people, families, who had fled for their lives with whatever they could carry on their backs and on their heads, and with whichever of their children they could find in the smoldering, terrifying chaos. Witnessing them trek in their weary, bedraggled lines from over the border into our village always left me reflecting on how only the randomness of our respective parents' nationalities had given me from birth a life of luxury. And by luxury, I don't mean monetary wealth, but the luxuries of freedom, peace, opportunity, enough food to eat, and them lives of such deprivation and pain. I had done no more to deserve that luxury than they had done to deserve that pain. By a chance ordering of the universe, a, a, a quirk of citizenship and geography over which none of us had any control, they had drawn the short straw. I, and most of you, had drawn the long and found ourselves surrounded all our lives by pirate chests brimming with glittering treasure. It's really hard to see how our well-being or the well-being of our world is best served by hoarding that inestimable good fortune. I find in speaking even with highly educated Americans, there is a lot of confusion around the words immigrant, refugee, asylee, asylum seeker. An internally displaced person, first of all, is a person who has been forced to leave his or her home, but has stayed within the confines of the borders of um, their own country. An immigrant is someone who has left their country with the intention of going to another country to live permanently. It is a very broad term, encompasses a bunch of different kinds of people who have come 
who have been foreign born and are now living in a, another country. But in common everyday parlance, the word immigrant is often taken to mean economic migrant, somebody who decided, who chose to leave their country to come to another one in order to better themselves or to have a better chance for their family at an easier life. A refugee is a very specific kind of immigrant and the, there is a definition that has been accepted by the United Nations and most countries of the world. It's very particular and it has to do with someone who has been forced to flee so there is no voluntary aspect to it. They have been forced to flee if they wanted to stay safe and alive. They have been forced to flee their country because of a well-founded fear of persecution in that country based on these factors, race, religion, nationality, political opinion, and or membership in a particular group. The two main operative words here are flee and persecution. They have to have fled their country, they had no choice in this, and because of persecution. And a government, their own government, either unable or unwilling to protect them. Most refugees go first, they flee first, obviously, to whatever country is right next to them. So a Somali will flee to Kenya, a Congolese will flee to um, Uganda, whatever country is right next to them. And they seek first asylum there. Often in those countries they are put in a refugee camp. It is while they are in that country that they apply to the United Nations for refugee status. And the, the United Nations is the one that designates this person as in, uh, an internationally recognized refugee or, or not. An asylum seeker is someone who comes, for example, to the United States, not as a refugee, but comes on some other visa, a student visa or a work visa or a tourist visa, and while here claims, if I go back to my country, I will be persecuted and in danger, unable to be protected by my own country. So they apply then for asylum status, if it is granted, they become asylees and in the United States are given almost all the same rights and responsibilities as a, a refugee. A few unfun facts. There are 68 and a half million people who are displaced from their homes in the world. And of these, 28 and a half are living as refugees, asylees, or asylum seekers. That is outside their own countries. Most refugees are living in low-income countries. Often we think that refugees are they're, they're mostly in Europe and the United States or whatever, but the Europe and the United States has a minority of, of, of refugees. Most are living in dirt poor countries. Two thirds of them are living in those four, Turkey, Bangladesh, Uganda, and Sudan. Numbers are very difficult to imagine. When you get that big, they're meaningless. So it is helpful sometimes to put them in other terms. If you put all the world's refugees into, or all the world's displaced people into rowboats such that each boat exceeds its maximum three times, you can line the boats up from Damascus to New York and you'd still have over 700,000 boats left. Or if we come closer to home and you look at Centennial Field, you can, Everybody knows what Centennial Field is, right? I had to discover it. But yeah. <laughs> you can fill Centennial Field, every single seat in Centennial Field, every single day, 365 days a, a year. You put them, you put people in and you take them out. The next day you put more people in, you take them out. More people in, you take them out. You can do that for more than 17 years. 17 years of doing that before you're able to seat all of the world's refugees. Not displaced people, but refugees. The problem is huge. Antonio Gutierrez, who used to be the uh, head of the UNHCR, High Commission for Refugees, now is head of the United Nations. While every refugee story is different and their anguish personal, they all share a common thread of uncommon courage. The courage not only to survive and to persevere and rebuild, not only to survive but to persevere and rebuild their shattered lives. And it's a huge privilege and pleasure to be working with refugees now. I see this every single day. They are incredible people, the refugees who come into this country. 
The international community has identified three what are called durable solutions to refugees. So you have these millions and millions of people who are refugees in different countries, displaced um, outside of their own country. And there are three things, three possible solutions that will get them out of this stateless state of limbo. One of them is voluntary repatriation. That is, they could eventually go back to their own home. The second is local integration. That is, they could go become integrated, accepted as part of the society of whatever country they have fled into, a Somali into Kenya, for example, given the rights and responsibilities of a Kenyan citizen. Or they can be resettled. Almost all refugees want the first solution. They don't want to leave their country. They want to go back to where they came from. They want to go back to their homes. The problem is that most of these conflicts are not conflicts that last for a year or two. They last for many years. Often they last for decades. And once refugees have left their country, what they're leaving behind has been burned, destroyed, taken over by other people. There's often very little to go back to. Local integration. Well, you've seen how well that's worked in the United States, which is a rich country. And yet when refugees or um, uh, asylum seekers come and want to integrate into our own country, how much difficulty we have. We say that they're going to be a problem. They're going to take our jobs and, 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 and so on. And how much more of a problem is that going to be in poor countries? How many refugees can a country like Kenya really absorb, or a country like Uganda, how much can they really absorb before their own economy starts to suffer. Resettlement is a last resort. And a resettlement is where refugees go into uh, a third country. So they've gone to a first country of asylum. They've been designated as a refugee by the international uh, United Nations. And then there are 35 countries in the world that will accept a certain number of these refugees for permanent resettlement in their own country. And the United States has always been a leader among these uh, 35 countries. We say, come in, we will give you uh, some help for a while, and we will put you on a path to permanent residency and citizenship. That's resettlement. There's always a concern about security, and that's a very legitimate concern. If a country is going to be accepting foreigners, it's reasonable, especially if they're coming from conflict-ridden society, it's reasonable for countries to say, well, how can I be sure that you are not going to bring those problems into my country? So are refugees vetted before they come to the United States? Well, yes, of course they are. And how do we do it? Do we give them a piece of paper and we say, you check yes if you're a terrorist, you check no if you're not, and if you, as long as you check no, we'll let you come in. No, we don't do that. We do a little bit more than that. Well, do we look at them? And we say, you look like a dangerous character. We're not going to take you. Or you look OK. Yeah, we'll take you. No, we do a little bit more than that. In fact, refugees go through more than 20 different steps before they are vetted from a security um, standpoint. I think there are six different government um, uh, departments that are, that are involved. And it takes years. It takes years for them to get through this. And every time they get through one step, there's an expiry date on all those documents. So that if they don't get through all these other steps in time, certain documents are going to expire, and they're going to have to go back to the beginning of the queue and start all over again. So refugees are vetted far, 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 far more than any other person coming to the United States. We don't look compared to this. We don't look twice at immigrants. We don't look twice at people coming on tourist visas, people who come on work visas, people we don't. Refugees, it takes them years to get through the gamut of, um, of vetting. Last year, uh, it was decided that this, these 21 steps were not enough, that we really needed to add a few more steps. Those 21 steps, by the way, they've been in place for, for decades. This is, that's nothing new. What's new since last year is these. Um, we've increased. We're taking even more data than we did before, going through all their social uh, media accounts and so on, going back generations into their family to see if there's any suspicion of um, foul play. More information sharing among the different um, law enforcement agencies. And people who interview uh, the refugees are being, be being better trained to spot inconsistencies in refugee stories. If a refugee doesn't tell exactly the same story every time, 
Or if a husband tells a story and the wife's version is a little bit different, that now gets spotted as an inconsistency and reason to suspect that something's going on. There is an international legal framework uh, for the protection of refugees going back to 1948. These have been signed by most of the countries of the world, and the United States is among those who have signed them, saying that we recognize that the refugee problem is a problem that belongs to all of us. It doesn't belong just to the neighbors of the countries that are in conflict, that when it could happen anywhere. And we, as an international community, understand that we have some responsibility in taking care of people who are, or protecting people who are caught in this kind of bind. These protections include respecting the principle of non refoulement, which means non refoulement, not sending back. Literally, it's a French word, means not, not to send back. It means that if somebody comes to the border of your country, and this is any country in the world who has signed these agreements, the person comes to the border of your country and says that I have been persecuted in my country, he has every legal right to enter your country. And it's up to you then to decide or to, to listen to the plea and decide whether it is um, true or not. We have said that we are responsible for admitting these people in a safe way to ensuring fair access to fair procedures, humane standards of treatment, and to implementing and to trying our best to implement at least one of the durable solutions. So how are we doing? The durable solutions again, voluntary repatriation, local integration, and resettlement. Fewer than 3% of refugees find one of these solutions. The UNHCR has determined that for the, the calendar year 2019, uh, there are going to be a need for 1.4 million places for refugees needing resettlement. 1.4 million, that's a lot, but it's not a lot when you look at the number of refugees in the world. It's really a very small percentage. So they're saying we need, we have no other solution for these 1.4 million people unless they can be resettled. And the 35 countries in the world who are willing to take refugees for resettlement um, are expected, all 35 of them together, to provide places for 75,000. So how are we doing? Well, sometimes cartoonists speak more eloquently than essayists. Sometimes I think our fear of refugees is fear of our own shadow as we remember what the first refugees to this country did to the indigenous population. My last, my last boat slide, I promise you. And this one, a big ship in the middle of the ocean and a uniformed captain standing on the bow, leaning over the railing, calling out, where are you from? Far below his bow, a rowboat filled with people, so jam-packed their heads look like kernels of corn on a cob. They are clearly migrants, refugees from some situations so dire they were willing to be stuffed into a rickety rowboat and face near certain calamity on the open sea. So where are you from? The captain shouts, and someone from within the depths of the boat calls out, Earth. In other words, we are all in this complicated world together. I get asked sometimes, what is the best field of study for someone interested in global health or international development um, in places of great need? And the list of options is endless because the issue is less one of technicity than one of willingness to do it. Business people, lawyers, Engineers, environmentalists, doctors, writers, artists, nurses, teachers. Everyone with a passion for making the world a better place has a role to play and a road to take. Peace Corps set up the bridge for me. I walked across it and then I just kept on going, never overly concerned when the course ahead seemed uh, to disappear. Another of your 
wonderful New Englanders, Emerson, uh, said or advised us not to worry if the way ahead is not always evident. In fact, he said, do not go where the path may lead. Go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. We are all in this complicated world together. As surely as all boats are raised by a rising tide, all will be pulled under if the millions who have no boat go down. Ensuring that everyone has a boat may be beyond us, maybe beyond even the most ardent global health enthusiast, but ensuring that everyone has access to a boat is most definitely not. Global health is everything that goes into ensuring access to health for all. We may do it in some far off part of the globe, or we may do it in that part of the globe we call our own backyard. But whenever we make life better for someone else, we help make life better for all. Thank you very much. It depends on what you mean by interaction. I've spoken there. Um, uh, I've been involved in programs that they have funded. They, they usually fund huge programs, so I just am a part of it. But, um, yeah. Yes. What was one of the most shocking things that you saw? What was the most shocking thing that I saw? Um, I suppose the most shocking things that I saw were the, the things that happened at the end of my stay in Kolofata when we were being troubled by Boko Haram and uh, the attacks on the people and the decapitations and the suicide bombs and that sort of thing. If that's what you mean by shocking. Yes. On a social level, the most shocking thing, I guess, was the corruption, the, the all-pervasiveness of the corruption, which Maybe shocking isn't the word because it's, you're so used to it, it's very tiresome. The, um, the never endingness of it. I was just wondering if you could tell a bit about um, the peace groups you're in Niger and then gone back to Niger since the 70s and how the buildings are now compared to the various problems here. I haven't gone back to Niger since, uh, since I left. Um, so I can't really speak to that. I only know what I read. And um, obviously Niger is still, still suffering greatly. It, it has gone through periods when it looked like it was going to uh, make some great improvements. And Boko Haram has had a big effect um, on that country, particularly out towards the eastern side um, of the country, it has set things back. Um, it's a, it's a tough place. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm Jules Mitchell. I am from the Democratic Republic of Congo. From? The Democratic Republic of Congo. Democratic Republic of Congo. Yeah. Yes. So uh, I'd like to thank you because in this second job, uh, I remember when I was senior physician, because back home when we are, we are done with medical, medical school, 
the same way that you write the same way in the village. So you need to learn, you need to practice a lot. I'm sorry, English is my third language, so I <laughs> So I remember when I was in the, in the village, so I practiced a lot, I learned a lot. I wrote very hard. I think one day when I went to the hospital, after the, the, like the three uh, centuries, the occasion session when I was a junior physician, and when I, I, I went back home, I opened my bedroom, I found one big snake. So imagine what happened. So I know it's very, very important to help uh, a physician to understand how the world, because uh, when a student finish class here, they have a lot of materials. So they can practice easily, but at home, very, very, very difficult. And it was hard for some physicians that are to practice the country. So they move in South Africa, Botswana. So when one day we found a lot of uh, physicians from Congo that practice very, very good. So I like just to think it is very, very important. So everyone needs to make something to change the world. So here I am a student in health. I think my goal is if I'm done with the program, maybe if uh, I have the opportunity, I can sometimes get the, use the equipment to bring back home. Because sometimes it happens when you are doing the surgery, you have only one blood. So imagine what happened. It was not very simple to continue to have people. But I'm, I moved here because I want a hotel. I want a refugee. So um, it's very, very important. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I had a your story um, <laughs> reminds me of, I had a Congolese surgeon working with me for, for um, many years. And during the first uh, months of his stay in, in Kolofata, my town, uh, he also came down from the hospital into his home and found a snake in his house. And he panicked really seriously. He was on the phone with me. What? So I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, snakes were pretty common, and colophatans were used to snakes, but um, maybe it's a Congolese thing. <laughs> oh, hi. Um, as a student planning to go into medicine and planning to go into humanitarian aid, do you have any words of advice? Do it. <laughs> what else can I say? Do it. And once it gets in your blood, it doesn't get out, which is a good thing. Yeah. Good evening. Um, I want to start off by saying that it's Asian Allies and Paris and students here who are interested in Peace Corps, although I'm going to be a Peace Corps volunteer. I mean, Peace Corps leader, but I'm just a volunteer. And I would love to speak with you if you want to talk about how you can use your own time on my experience. I was also a volunteer at the Wilson Week, and I just got back to my students in July. I, I am much more attracted to people than I am to animals or land. So Cameroon is a beautiful place, um, and we do have game reserves and that sort of thing. But it's the people that I just—they—they they fascinate me endlessly. Just their whole way of looking at life, which is so different from ours. And I never stopped learning from them. They just had so much to teach me about life 
and living that, um, that I really prize. And they love to laugh, and, and um, it's just nice being with them, even when they're suffering. They, they, they have a sense of humor and a sense uh, they're so down to earth and um, realistic and accepting, and they don't complain, and they, they don't expect a lot, and they just want to get on with life. They want to take care of their families, and um, it's just it's very refreshing. That's, that's what I love most. And this one. Um, I have two questions. Um, maybe three. Yes, me. Uh, but I'm wondering, we've been back in the States for a few years now. Three years. Three years. Um, first, I guess I'm wondering what your transition back to the States was like after being gone for so long. Um, second, I'm wondering if you still are involved with your work abroad, um, and if you still go back and run um, back. And I'm still very much involved in Colofata. I'm in touch with them every week anyway. We still um, have people supporting their the hospital. The hospital, in spite of being overrun uh, by this conflict, the hospital has kind of been a steady presence through it all. It has never shut its doors. Um, and it's still going strong, so uh, we're still supporting that as much as we can, and other things going on in that part um, of Cameroon as well. Um, transition, you know, to this day, I still literally get a thrill when I flip a switch and a light comes on. I can't get used to that. It's wonderful. Or turn a tap and the water just comes out. I mean, you don't even have to wonder, is it going to come out? It just comes out. And so that, I don't know if that'll ever go, but I still do really think, wow. So that's been nice. Um, um, our politics are a little bit worrisome and difficult for me to get used to because it doesn't jive with what I thought America was for all those years. And I don't know whether that's because things have changed here or because I was living under a cloud um, else, elsewhere. Um, so that's been a little bit hard for me to get used to, to kind of mesh that with what I always thought we were. Yeah. <laughs> Are you trying to get involved with refugee resettlement in America? So that's what I, I, I work with refugees. Not I work with re resettlement agencies, but I'm not employed by them. I work with a, a local health department. So we are the ones who take care of the refugees from a health point of view for the first um, first few months of, of their arrival. Are you doing this nationally, or are you doing it with, with refugees? Yes. Locally, in my own community, Marion County, Indianapolis, Indiana. And you have not only the passion and this part of the pages, but the way with words for your poet as well. And the way you put this together is so moving and so inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. That's very nice. I wish I was a poet. <laughs> for your, your poetic um, way of speaking. It's just beautiful to hear. Um, and I think you raise a really important sort of moral issue that what is the difference between, you know, me being born here to, um, you know, middle class lifestyle and someone who's born um, in a country where they don't have the same opportunities. And I'm just wondering if you can flesh that out a little bit more and just talk about for those folks that aren't engaging in global development or, or humanitarian work as a career, how to think about what we can do. Um, writing a check is obviously and um, when we think about doing. I think many of us don't write a check um, and forego that cup of coffee at the same time. So just thought you might just want to talk on that. I think the first thing that we have to do as Americans is educate ourselves. Um, my impression was that when a lot of these terrible things came down against refugees at a national level, the people who were making these pronouncements didn't even know what a refugee was. And I think a lot of our politicians, in fact, I know a lot of our politicians, I've spoken with some of them, 
Maybe they do now, but certainly when this was all going on, they didn't know what a refugee was. Imagine people sitting up there representing us, and they don't even know what a refugee is. So we have to educate ourselves. We have to vote. Um, those, are the, those are the two main things, I think, because America is should be doing so much good in the world. Um, yeah, and, and it's up to each and every one of us, whether we're over there doing it or whether we're here um, supporting those who do it. It's, it's, it's all the same. But we have a huge, huge, huge moral responsibility. And any of you who have worked in poor countries, you know how America is seen. Um, by poor people. I mean, there are those who denigrate it, but there are those who look up to it, and I would say that that is far more common. They look to the United States for moral direction. They, they, you know, when everything else, when every other country is doing stupid things, they, they, they say, well, it depends on what America is going to do. And that we have some weight in the world, and we squander a lot of, um, a lot of that. Hi, thank you for being here. I just wanted to also sort of piggyback what, what you were saying about Peace Corps. And um, I was a Peace Corps volunteer back in the 80s, and Peace Corps has a wonderful return, another program for Peace Corps response volunteers. And this is for professionals who are already working in like in positions or I'm a therapist, all sorts of positions. It's a one year commitment, Peace Corps takes very good care of you. So there are some things that you can do. Um, you don't even have to have been a Peace Corps volunteer to be a Peace Corps response volunteer. And um, I guess I would just also say that for those of you who are in my demographic, we also can send our kids off to Peace Corps. So lots, lots that we can do. Peace, Peace Corps is, is amazing. I don't know if it's the people who go into Peace Corps who are amazing or Peace Corps does something to you. But if you look around um, at the people you know, in government, people in public health, people in universities, how many of them have been in Peace Corps and they remain socially engaged? And again, I don't know if that's because it's the kind of person who goes into Peace Corps in the first place or that you get that into your blood and you can't let go of it. But there's, there's an, enga an engagement, a commitment that comes out of that experience, I think, that um, is very beneficial to our country. So more people should go. Given that you talk about the level of corruption, I'm wondering how you actually have not finished making a hospital that is sustainable. And the level of poverty that's there. Um, boy. <laughs> I'll just, you just kind of keep putting one foot in front of the other and you just keep going. That, that, that's, that's all. And, and um, you don't give in to the corruption, which is very difficult and it puts roadblocks in your way sometimes, but you don't give into it. And um, eventually you get known as somebody who will not go along with that system, and uh, that is helpful. But at the beginning, it's, it's, um, it's tough because of that. People expect you to pay up just like everybody else is paid up. And if you don't, you, 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 um, you're punished for it. But you stick to your guns. I think Serena is playing. Thank you. Okay. Just wondering how, thinking about the corruption and the challenges that you face, surely there must have been moments over the three decades where you felt frustrated and I'll use the word jaded. What was it in you? that helped you put one foot forward? What, where did you find strength to that, overcome that? That's an easy question. Any time I got like that, and I got like that a lot, I would go find a baby, a little patient who was suffering and needed help or that had been helped or something, and that made all that go away instantly. You find a baby. Yeah.
Good evening, everyone. I just wanted to say thank you to uh, Ellen and um, just listening to you, um, working with you three years ago now. Um, I didn't know a lot of this, but um, just listening to you talking last hour really gave me hope for our world. I mean, I, I, I really hope and there are going to be a lot of people here. And uh, um, like uh, you said, your kids you can send out in, into Peace Corps. And I, I, it really, this really lifted my heart that you could take out of your time from where you came from to go to Colo Father. Like I told you earlier, I said, there, I'm jealous. I could have some places in Liberia would love for you to be. But in Colo Father, I mean, you're there for 30 years doing this kind of work. And that's just lifts my heart. And I think it gave me hope for it for um, our world. And I want to thank you. I know she's terribly bad at self promotion, so I'm going to put a plug in for her. Um, she released a book of her experiences in Cameroon. Um, really heartfelt and heart wrenching stories of all the medical care that she provided, as well as her experiences with Boko Haram and being a kidnapping target and being under gendarme guard for over 15 months experiencing the habit of the village. So the name of the book is Life and Death in Colorado, an American Doctor in Africa. It's a, it's a really good read. I'm a little biased, but I encourage you to buy the book. Thank you so much for